All right, so we are going to conclude lecture two for unit one with discussing the three main types of research. So we're going to talk about descriptive research, correlational research, and experimental research. So descriptive research, just like the title says, its goal is to describe a phenomenon. It's not to answer any specific questions about a relationship, right? So it's not trying to say this is affecting that or this has a relationship with that or this has an effect on that. Um, it's just trying to describe a phenomena or a variable. So this percentage of this group does this, right? You're just trying to look at a description. On average, how many hours do college students study each week? On average, how many hours of exercise do working professionals get each week? On average, how many, um, how many working mothers tend to develop anxiety problems, right? So you're, you're just trying to create a number, a statistic, a description for a phenomenon. There are a couple variations of descriptive studies to be aware of. There are case studies, and a case study is an in-depth look at one or two cases. The benefit of a case study is it can help to support or illustrate a theory, or it can present a challenge to a theory, or it can allow you to describe a very unique situation. The challenge to a case study is that it's not generalizable. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So one thing, so I'm, I'm a developmentalist, right? My, my main area is developmental psychology. And one case that gets talked about a lot is there was a little girl, she was neglected by her parents to the point of basically not even having any attention from them. Um, she was pretty much locked in a room the first night years. She was so neglected that she never even learned how to speak. That's how little her parents actually interacted with her. A lot of case studies have come from that simply because that's not something that happens a lot, right? I can't go out in the U.S. and say, hey, I want a random sample of all the kids who were so neglected by their parents that they didn't even learn how to talk. It just, it, we don't have big numbers of that. That's something that never happens, right? That's a super, super rare situation. Uh, the case that we talked about in the first video with Phineas Gate, right, where the railroad spike like went through his chin out of his brain and it changed his personality. That's a case study. I can't go out and look for a random sample of people who have been impaled through the brain and survived and look how their personality changed because it happens so rarely. I just, I can't do it. So sometimes you have a case study that it has to be a case study because it's a really unique situation. Another time you have a case study that maybe somebody totally goes against what you would expect because of a theory or because of previously established research. And it was really interesting to look at what are some of the elements of their life that may make them somebody who goes against the trends seen in this theory. That's why in psychology, we have to be so careful. If you have a, a phenomenon that has been found through research, if you have a, a phenomenon that is validated by a theory and somebody raises their hand and goes, well, I don't know that that's true because my cousin's best friend's roommate, da -da 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 -da, right? What they have there is a case study. There's always gonna be cases that go against the theory. No theory is 100% every single person is going to go along with this. But whenever you have a disagreement with a well-established relationship, phenomena, theory, whatever, what you have is a case study. Now, investigating those cases can be very interesting to see if we can identify, well, maybe it's because this person has these features. So now we can do research with these features and see if, if I collect a bunch of people with these features, do they all or do they most disagree with this, right? Because maybe I can find an exception to my theory or an exception to my finding. So they can challenge a theory or they can provide support or illustration for a theory, right? I have this textbook theory. Let me provide you with this really interesting case that shows how that works or that shows how that looks in everyday life. The other important element of a 
the, the other important variation of descriptive study is naturalistic observation. And that's where you observe people in your natural in their natural environment. You're not trying to manipulate anything. You're not trying to change anything. You're just observing what they do. You're describing their behavior without explaining it. If I wanted to explain the social interactions of American high school students at a public place in the middle of the pandemic, right? Maybe I go and sit at the mall and observe the behaviors of the kids who are still going and eating at the food court at the mall. Um, I'm not trying to change anything. I'm not trying to manipulate anything. I'm just sitting there observing it and describing it. The next form of study is a correlation. The key thing to remember about a correlation is that correlation does not equal causation. With correlation, all I'm trying to say is that these two variables are related. When one changes, the other changes. One goes up, the other goes up, one goes down, the other goes down, one goes up, the other goes down, vice versa, right? As one changes, the other changes. I cannot say that one is causing the other. Now, I might do research, find that there's a correlation and say, logically, I think that perhaps the reason this relationship exists is that maybe this one causes this one. I would recommend that future research do an experimental study to see if that's true, right? That'd be in like the recommendations and implications section of the research article. But if I have done a correlation study, I cannot claim I have found any sort of cause or effect. I can only say I have found a relationship. Does changing one of these things in a statistically significant way predict a change in the other? Now, when you have correlations written up, they're gonna be in the form of a number from negative one to positive one. Zero means no, co no correlation, nothing was significant there. The closer that you get to negative 101, the stronger the correlation. Anything less than 0.4 is weak or negative 0.4. Anything between 0.5 and 0.7 or negative 0.5 and 0.7 is moderate. Anything above 0.7 or negative 0.7 is strong. A positive number indicates a positive correlation, which means they are changing in the same direction. As one goes up, the other goes up. As one goes down, the other goes down. That's an important point to remember. It can be a positive relationship and they can both be going down together. Positive just means they're moving in the same direction. A negative number, a negative correlation coefficient is the term, means that they are changing in different directions. As this one goes up, this one goes down. Or vice versa, as this one goes down, this one goes up. Um, so an example of that might be the more sodas I drink, the fewer, the less sleep quality I have, right? My soda goes up, my sleep quality goes down. Or the less amount of caffeine I drink during the day, in the morning, the less energy I have throughout the day. Caffeine goes down. Wait, that was wrong. That was totally wrong because then caffeine goes down, energy goes down. Uh, the less amount of, the less caffeine that I drink, the more likely I am to feel lethargic in the afternoon, right? Caffeine goes down, level of lethargy goes up. See, it's tricky. It's easy to, to say it wrong, even if you've been doing this for a very long time. But, so positive, they're changing together. Negative, they're changing in opposite directions. Hopefully my one little miswording did not just totally confuse you. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Uh, the last type is an experiment. An experiment is where you are trying to determine cause and effect. Now, there are two things that I as the researcher must have the power to do for it is to be a true experiment. One, I have to have the power to randomly assign my participants into groups. And two, I have to have the power to manipulate my independent variable. So what do I mean by this? If I cannot randomly assign you into a group, it is not a true experiment. So for example, I cannot do a true experiment on does binge drinking during pregnancy predict child's intelligence because I could not ethically randomly assign pregnant women to 
you are going to binge drink two to three times a month while you're pregnant, then you are not. It would be totally unethical because I know that there could be a possibility of all sorts of bad things happening to those women that I'm telling to binge drink. I would also maybe not be able to randomly assign people if it's something that I just logically can't control. I cannot do a true experiment on limiting, limiting television content for, for children ages three to 13 and later behavioral effects. Why? Because I cannot reasonably find 200 families that will let me come into their home for 10 years and have complete control over what their kids watch on TV. It's not reasonable. So I have to have the power to randomly put people into groups. I could never do an experiment about sexual orientation being the cause and something else being the effect because I cannot randomly assign you into a group to say, are you going to later identify as gay or lesbian or are you going to identify as heterosexual? I can't do it. So I have to have the power to randomly assign you groups. The second thing is I have to have the power to manipulate the independent variable. So independent variable, deep variable, dependent variable, what is affecting what? My independent variable is the thing that I think is the cause. If I cannot manipulate it, then I, I cannot say that I have a true experiment. I have to have the power to manipulate it. Um, and having the power to manipulate the independent variable is very similar to having the power to randomly assign to groups in that I, um, Maybe I can't do it because of ethical reasons, or maybe I can't do it because of logical reasons. But I have to have the power to manipulate the independent variable. I could never do a true experiment on does having a divorce decrease life satisfaction? Because if I have a random sample of married people and my independent variable is going to be divorce, I do not have the power to manipulate divorce, right? I can't say, okay, in this group, you're going to have a divorce. In this group, you're going to reconcile. I, I don't have the power to manipulate it. Your experimental group is the group that's being manipulated or receiving your experimental treatment. Your control group is the group that's not receiving your experimental treatment. They're receiving a control variable. If I wanted to say, does consuming caffeine before exercise increase your endurance? My experimental group, I would hand you a Red Bull. Or a monster. My control group, I would hand you a glass of water. You're you're not receiving the experimental. You're receiving a control. You're receiving something that should not have any impact. You are the comparison group if you are the control group. Okay? You're what I'm comparing the experiment to. Does the Red Bull have a bigger impact than just drinking a glass of water before you exercise? Now, in a blind double bind experiment, People don't know their groups. So a blind experiment, the participants do not know what group they are in. You receive a placebo, right? If I'm testing out a new antidepressant, I have everybody come in and maybe, so I have everybody come in and I'm assigning them into groups and experimenting them in control. And I say, some of you are getting a new antidepressant. Well, some of you are getting that, the ones in the experimental group are. The control group, is getting some sort of placebo. They're either getting a true placebo, like a sugar pill, or maybe they're getting an antidepressant that we already know how it works. We already know the effect, so we're able to compare it and control it. So by a blind study, you as the participant do not know if you are experimental or controlled. A double blind, neither does the experimenter. Somebody assigns it for me, I know group one and group two, but I do not know which group is getting what. So as I just said, the control group will often receive a placebo, which is an inactive substance, or they'll receive a control substance, like an already established medicine. The placebo effect is where you have changes that are still caused by the placebo, right? Somebody expects it to change, so it actually does change. I'm taking a sugar pill, but I'm noticing a difference because I think I'm getting treatment. It's, it's mind over matter. I had an, ex an expectancy and it changed. I am running out of time again. So this unit will have three lecture videos and we will pick up with
what the Hawthorne effect is, because that's actually really